number two, there was a time, there's a story told about an angel that appeared at a faculty meeting of a school and tells the dean of students that in return for his unselfish and exploitary behavior, the Lord was going to reward him with a choice of infinite wealth, wisdom, or beauty, whatever he wanted. Without hesitating, the dean selected, I want infinite wisdom. In which the angel said, poof, it's done. It disappears in the cloud of smoke and a bolt of lightning. At that point in time, everyone in the, in the room during that faculty meeting turned their head to the dean and witnessed a, him being uh, surrounded by a kind of a faint halo of light, if you would. At length, one of his colleagues whispers, well, say something, say something. The dean looks at them and says with his newfound wisdom, I should have taken the money. I should have taken the money instead. <laughs> Ouch, huh? You know, throughout our lives, we all have to make decisions and confront different issues in which we really don't know what to do, right? You ever been in those circumstances that you just don't know what to do? I have no idea what to do. However, the God of heaven always knows what to do. Every circumstance, no matter how complicated the situation might be from our perspective. Now, in our text, Daniel and his three companions, by the name of, we know them as uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are confronted with a very serious issue. An issue that was potentially going to take their lives. But instead of panicking and trying to conjure up a plan of all their own and how they're going to get out of it, they begin to seek God and get some much needed wisdom to handle the situation which resulted in their crisis becoming a great triumph for them. And really for, I think, all people as a result. Daniel chapter 2, we'll pick it up in verse 14. We're going to be looking at much of this chapter here today. But we'll read through verse 30. It says, Then Daniel answered with counsel and wisdom to Arach, the captain of the king's guard, which was gone forth to slay the wise men of Babylon. He answered and said to Arach, the, captain, the king's captain, Why is the decree so hasty from the king that Arach uh, made uh, the thing known to Daniel? Then Daniel went in and desired of the king that he would give him time and that he would show the king the interpretation. Then Daniel went to his house and uh, made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the Babylonian names, his companions, that they should desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning this secret, that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changed the times and the seasons. He removed the kings and set up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise, and knowledge to them that know understanding. He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness, and the light dwelleth with him. I thank thee and praise thee, O thou God of my fathers, who hast given me wisdom and might, and hast made known unto me now what we desire of thee, for thou hast, thou hast now made known unto us the king's matter. Therefore Daniel went in unto Herak, whom the king had ordained to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said unto, thus unto him, Destroy not the wise men of Babylon, bring me in before the king, and I will show unto the king the interpretation. Then Herak brought to Daniel, brought in Daniel before the king in haste, and said unto, thus unto him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah, and, they will, and that will make known unto the king the interpretation. The king answered and said to Bel Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, Art thou able to make known unto me the dream which I have seen and the interpretation thereof? Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king hath demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers show unto the king. But there is a God in heaven that reveals secrets, and make it known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Thy dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into my, thy mind upon thy bed. What should come to pass hereafter? And he that revealeth secrets maketh known to thee what shall come to pass. But as for me, this secret is not revealed to me from any wisdom that I have more than any living, but for their sakes that shall make known the interpretation to the king, and that thou mightest know the thoughts of thy heart. We'll look at this subject a little bit more in the story behind it as we talk today about the need for God's wisdom 
the need for God's wisdom. Let's go ahead and pray first. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity again to be here to thank you for this, uh, this story within the, the pages of the Old Testament to declare the great truth about our need to give good wisdom, especially in circumstances we don't know what to do. We ask now you bless our time here in Jesus' name. The Bible teaches us that one of the greatest things a person can ever acquire in life is this thing called wisdom. The book of Proverbs is a book of wisdom. And we, we sometime back went through a study of verse by verse, subject by subject through the book of Proverbs. I think we did it on a Wednesday night series. But throughout the book of Proverbs, you see this, this phraseology referring to the necessity of wisdom and us gleaning it. Uh, Proverbs 4, 7 says, wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom with all thy getting, get understanding. And again, wisdom is the principal thing, the primary thing, the most important thing that, that a person can gain as they walk through life. Proverbs 8, 11 says, For wisdom is better than rubies, and all the things that may be desired are not to be compared to, to it. The idea is that wisdom is better than anything that we can get financially speaking or, or that we can attain in this life. It's something that we desperately need if we're going to navigate this life and not shipwreck. People can get rubies, people can get money, people can get all these different things that, that you can attain in this life, but can shipwreck their lives and destroy what they have. But through wisdom, we can we can guide our lives and be guided safely to the harbors of, that will bring greatest blessing. Webster defines the word wisdom as the right use of or exercise of knowledge. It, it goes beyond just having knowledge, but it's the actual right usage of that knowledge. It says, it, it, he also said, the choice of laudable, or, which means praiseworthy or, or good ends, and the best means to accomplish them. Again, people in this world have knowledge. There are many people today who are sitting in the prison systems of our country. They have a lot of knowledge. They develop and devise some pretty radical schemes. They're, they're knowledge, but they don't have a lot of wisdom, do they? In other words, they didn't use that knowledge in a productive way, a, a, a not, in a way that helps others. They use it to destroy others in some regards. That's the difference between wisdom and knowledge. Wisdom is the right usage of the knowledge that we get. There was an author that once wrote this about wisdom. He said, wisdom is the power to see and the inclination to choose the best and highest goal together with the surest means of attaining it. So we need wisdom if we're going to do those things. Now, wisdom itself is not naturally born within us. We don't naturally come out of the womb just being wise. We don't naturally uh, walk through this life just having wisdom because it's something that's just been put within our system. It's something that has to develop over the course of time. Sometimes it does develop simply as the result of making some bad choices. And you realize, you know, I shouldn't have done that. There was an engineer at NASA who was assigned to prepare a presentation on the lessons learned from their bad experience was with the Hubble Space Telescope. On its chart at the briefing, lesson number one read, in naming your mission, never use a word that rhymes with the word trouble. Hubble, trouble, get it? All right, all right, some of you will get that eventually. You know, an easier way, though, to gain wisdom is by getting it from God himself. God himself has an infinite supply of wisdom. In fact, the Bible says in the Proverbs a couple times, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. When we respect God and what he says, that is the beginning of the wisest decisions we'll ever make. Because that means we respect what God says, and we honor what he says to the point we, we obey it. And the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Why? Because he's the source of all wisdom. God, uh, one of God's uh, traits is the fact that he is omniscient. That means that he's all-knowing. There's, there's nothing that he doesn't know, if I can put it that way. Psalm 147, verse 5 says, Great is our Lord, and of great power. His understanding is infinite. It's infinite. There's nothing beyond his capacity to know. You know, we, in our day, there's been the development of these supercomputers that can hold massive amounts of information. Now, there are people today that have massive amounts of information in their head. But they pale in comparison to what God knows. God knows so much more. The, the Bible says, in, in, I think it's 1 Corinthians 1, that the foolishness, the foolishness of God, not that he has any, but in comparison, if God had foolishness, it would still be smarter than man. <laughs> that's, that, that's, the, that's the significant level of God's intelligence. 
Thus, he is the source of all wisdom. He's the source of it all. He knows what to do, when to do it, and how to do it in every situation we could ever enter into in life. And sometimes we get into some real sticky situations, can't we? And sometimes life can present things that you just like, what do I do with this? But God knows what to do. And it's wonderful the fact that he is willing more than anything to share that wisdom with each and every one of us. The Bible says in Proverbs 2, 6, For the Lord giveth wisdom. Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. God is more than happy to give you and I the wisdom we need to, to make the decisions that we have to make for our lives. He's more than happy to do that. He doesn't hold back on that. We'll get into that more in here in a moment. But in our text, what you have here is uh, the setting is, the, is in Babylon. The Jewish nation has now been destroyed for the most part. It, uh, he's, uh, there's uh, been people brought to Babylon as a result of uh, uh, an exile that was taking place. It was something that God had ordained. Long story behind that. But now the, the setting of the book of Daniel is in Babylon. And uh, Daniel and his three companions have been uh, been trained or been in the process of being trained or just have been trained in, in the ways of the Chaldeans and so forth, the, the Babylonian people. And chapter 2 of this of Daniel opens up with Nebuchadnezzar. It says in verse 1, in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar. What, what you have here is not that Nebuchadnezzar has just been on the throne for a few years, but he has become the ultimate ruler of the world right at this time. He is the sole, uh, the sole ruler right now over the world. He has conquered everything. And that was something that God had ordained. And according to verse number 29, evidently the king was thinking about, okay, I'm the ruler now, what's going to happen to everything once I'm dead and gone? Or he was thinking about the future. And as a result, Nebuchadnezzar, wrote back in verse 1 of the same chapter, dreamed dreams whereof his spirit was troubled and his sleep break for him. In other words, he, he had a dream that was sent by God, revealing the future events that would come and the kingdoms that would come upon the face of the earth up until the time of the end. However, the king, despite not being able to remember his dream, desired to know what's meaning. He, he dreamed it, he, he woke up, but he couldn't remember the dream. You ever had that happen? You dream something so vivid, but you wake up, you can't even remember what it was. That's what happened with Nebuchadnezzar. He just woke up, it's like, oh. He's like, what in the world was that all about? And it bothered him so much that he wanted to know what it meant. So he calls in this group of people, verse 2. Then the king commands to call the magicians and the astrologers and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans for to show the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. So basically he called in all the, I'll put it in quotation, spiritual people at the time those that worked uh, in curious arts, let's just put it that way. And he brought them all in and said, hey guys, I had this dream and it bugged me. Tell me what it was and what it meant. Verse 3, And the king said unto them, I have dreamed a dream and my spirit was troubled to know the dream. Then spake the Chaldeans to the king of Syria, O king, live forever. Tell thy servants the dream and we will show you the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, the thing is gone from me. I can't remember it. If ye will not make known unto me the dream with the interpretation thereof, ye shall be cut in pieces, and your house shall be made a dumb hill. Well, that's a real nice guy here, isn't he? But if ye show the dream and the interpretation thereof, ye shall receive of me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and the interpretation thereof. Well, they, the astrologers in that crew, answered again and said, Let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation of it. They go back and forth here a little bit, like, uh, King, you got to tell us a dream here. We're going to interpret it. We've got to know what it is. got to be an unreasonable here. Well, verse 8 goes on and says, The king answered and said, I know of certainty that ye would gain the time because ye see the thing is gone from me. But if ye will not make known unto me the dream, there is but one decree for you, for ye have prepared lines for our words to speak before me. And I was, he's saying, If you guys can't tell me what this is, you're not really what you, you don't have all this power that you think you have. And, if I just told you the dream, you're just going to tell something that you conjure up in your mind. 
It says, therefore, tell me the dream, and I will know that me can show me the interpretation thereof. In other words, he's saying, if, if you can tell me what my dream was, then I know that you actually are legitimate. Well, of course they weren't. Verse 10, then the Chaldeans answered before the king and said, there is not a man upon the earth that can show the king's matter. In other words, he's saying, king, we, nobody can do that. Therefore, there is no king, nor lord, nor ruler that asks us things that any magician or astrologer of Chaldean is a rare thing that the king required. In other words, this doesn't happen. And there is none other that can show it before the king except the gods whose dwelling is not flesh. He said, you're saying the only, only supernatural gods can show you your, your dream king. We can't do it. We can't do it. Again, these guys couldn't help them out. They couldn't interpret the dream because even Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar couldn't remember the details of it. Well, humanly speaking, Nebuchadnezzar was, was being very unreasonable. <laughs> But he was the king, and he could do what he wanted. He was the sole ruler at that point. But this was of God, what was going on here. As God was going to make aware, everyone aware in the situation that he alone was the solution to this issue. But for that to be known, God allowed this situation to spiral, spiral into an alarming predicament involving the lives of many people. As we see, first off, the crisis. The crisis. Now, Nebuchadnezzar got excessively upset by the inability of his wise men, if you would, to interpret this dream for him. Nebuchadnezzar wasn't known either for it. wasn't known for his patience either. He was quite rash. We saw that already. You don't show me interpretation, I'm going to cut you in pieces and make your house in the I mean, all right, that's pretty blunt. But it goes on in verse 12. For this cause, the king was angry and very furious and commanded to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. He was quite rash. He got so mad, he just, all right, just kill them all. I mean, and the sad thing is he had the power to do that. You imagine what his Twitter feed looked like. <laughs> you know, sad. You know. <laughs> It's going to blast us out. As supreme word, ruler, Nebuchadnezzar's word was law. It evidently was meant to be done in peace. In fact, Daniel, when, when he was approached by Herod, the king's guard, he asked him, why is the decree so hasty from the king? In other words, he, he looked at the king's Somehow, the, king, the captain of the king's guard, he looked at us and said, you go kill them all now. I mean, it was just like, there was no waiting on this. I mean, this is a very hasty thing. It was very, a, a very big crisis. Of course, Daniel and his companions were considered wise men as they were educated individuals within the court of Babylon. Notice verse 13. And the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain. And they sought Daniel and his fellows to be slain. Daniel and his companions were in trouble. Now, had they caused this? No. And realistically, the, the, the magicians and the Chaldeans and the astrologers, they didn't really do anything either. They just couldn't do what was being asked, which was totally unreasonable, really, on Nebuchadnezzar's part, from a human standpoint, at least. Now, everyone's lives were in they, they were going to be cut off that night. There's a tremendous crisis as lives were at stake, unex that were at stake, and this unexpectedly fell into the lives of Daniel and his companions. This crisis. You know, sometimes in our lives too, crisis has come unexpectedly, don't they? You wake up and say, we're going to have a bright, shiny day, only to go to bed, and this was the worst day of your life. Or, or something happened that just has been stressing you out, and it's like, my soul, what do you do? Sometimes crises is it, don't they? I mean, or, or, or something happens. Sometimes they're not huge, but they hurt. Sometimes they are large, and they're painful. But regardless of what they are, the end result we are seeing right now with the crisis before us is that there is going to be some sort of 
loss. There's going to be some sort of loss unless this thing gets resolved. It might be a financial loss. We might suffer a financial loss as a result of this crisis. You know, the other day at our, at our house, we were we uh, we were turning on the sink and. I turn it over and turn the hot water that we have one of these things that swivel and you know it's colder one way, hotter the next, and I turn it over and and I'm like, there's no hot water. This isn't good. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I'm trying to figure out, okay, what are we how in the world is the little pipes frozen here? You know, that's what I'm thinking to myself. The hot water even. And uh, well we called our home we, we have a home warranty since we just got the house, our, our realtor gave it to us. So we called that, and the, the guy came out and said, you know, it's frozen. And uh, I'm like, oh no, what are we going to do here? Like, what can we do? We gave us some different options of warming the house more, which we did. But uh, we were concerned. We didn't want a pipe to burst. Because the pipes, I'm like, how are we going to get the pipes? Well, they're all buried in the walls. I'm like, oh no. Were we stressed a little bit? <laughs> like, oh no. It's the last thing I need. I just had something done on my car. Now I got this. I'm like, oh, what happened? Well, fortunately, we, we warmed up our house a little bit. We, we shut some of the vents, so we went down and, and warmed the certain room where the pipes were. And the frost, it was nice and warm in the house, but <laughs> at least I got the frost. But, but sometimes, those, I mean, that's just a little thing. It, it really compares to some other things that could happen. But you know, those things happen. You just wake up and all of a sudden it's like, oh man, this is what I wanted to deal with today. Again, sometimes they're small, but sometimes they are big. Sometimes they're really big. And, and at the moment in time, you just don't know what to do. Maybe it's, maybe it's our well-being. Maybe it's a relationship, an opportunity or a reputation. You know, just something. That the crisis is threatening. Regardless of what the crisis or problem might be, we have to first realize some things that probably isn't the most instant thing that pops into our mind. Is that this crisis, whatever it is, has been allowed by the hand of God to enter into our life. It's been allowed by God. God has given the okay on that. It's entered our life for a good reason. As we'll see in the case of Daniel and his companions. Now I just read Job here, the first couple of pack, chapters of the book of Job recently. And I was reading through this and it reminded me of what, how God allows things into our lives and, and holds certain things back. In Job chapter 1 we have a scenario in heaven where God it, 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 and Satan are having a little conversation. And God says, hey Satan, have you, have you seen Job? He said, He's a, he's a good man. You haven't gotten him to trip up. And then the Satan's pitching a fit in there. He said, well, the reason he's not cursing you is because you put a hedge of protection around all this stuff. And, and uh, you know, if he took that away, uh, he'll curse you to, to your face. God says, Job 1.12, the Lord said unto Satan, behold, all that he hath is in my power then. Go ahead, take it all away. Only upon himself put not forth thy hand. God said, you can take everything, but don't touch his life. So Satan went from the presence of the Lord, and that's exactly what took place. In that chapter, of course, he loses, he loses his, uh, his children, he loses his wealth, he loses a lot. Chapter 2, Satan challenges him again. And uh, God and he said, if you take away his health, then he'll curse you to his face, to your face. And God says, okay, we'll keep his life. You're not going to kill him. You're not going to take it out. So it goes on, and, and uh, Job gets smoked with boils. I mean, his body was aching. Not allowing all that, but there was a divine reason behind that. A good reason. Though at the time, Job couldn't see any of this. I don't know if Job ever knew all the details like we do today. But there was a, there was a divine thing going on. God allowed those things into Job's life, like he's allowing in Daniel's life, like he allows in your life and my life. For a reason. And he gives Satan, if you would, certain parameters. He can only go so far. He can only go so far. 
with what he does. But what God allows, may I say, is always with some sort of good in the end. Romans 8.28 communicates that to us, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. God doesn't allow something to happen if good cannot come out of it. And throughout Scripture, God has always allowed a problem to crop up before he does some of his best works. Now, understandably, that's hard to think about when it's the crisis, isn't it? Oh, well, yeah, and I'm sure most of us, when we hit a crisis, something happens, we're not saying, oh, praise the Lord, this is, this is a great opportunity. You know, <laughs> we don't think about it naturally, do we? I don't. But I'm trying to help us see from a biblical perspective that, look, the, the crises aren't there to kill us. They're, they're there to do something better and to propagate something good in our lives that wouldn't have happened otherwise. But I, I understand, as much as anybody here, that that's not easy to think in the midst of the problem or the crisis because the emotions can run pretty wild sometimes, real quick. But knowing this fact can help us from making some unwise choices driven by emotions. Some of the worst decisions you and I will ever make are decisions run by our emotions out of control. Or just kind of, you know, where we're flipping out or we've lost our head, if you would. Those are the worst decisions that we make. The worst thing we can do is lose our heads in a crisis. And just, just kind of lose it emotionally. We, we, can't, uh, we can't do that. You know, when we were in Mongolia, Aaron got caught there. You know, I heard about that he did a great job, by the way. I give compliments since he's not here today. <laughs> he did a great job. He didn't lose his head at all. And uh, he handled that as well as anybody could have when we were dealing with uh, some of the immigration officers over there. You know, I mean, you can't lose your head in crisis. You don't have to. None of us have to. <coughs> because if we do, it'll just make the problem worse. Because we'll start saying things and doing things out of sheer emotional fit which always creates a bigger problem. See, Daniel didn't do that. Daniel here, in, in chapter 2, verse 13, and the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain. And they sought Daniel and his fellows to be slain. Then Daniel answered with counsel and wisdom. What was that? To Aaron. How did he, he... He didn't start chucking things at Aaron. Because Aaron was the one there that was going to have... Ch -ch -ch. <laughs> He didn't do anything like that. He didn't pitch a fit. He didn't start screaming. He didn't start wailing. He didn't even say he answered with counsel and wisdom. Counsel and wisdom. Now, do you think Daniel probably was a little bit concerned in his heart? If he was a human being, yes, he probably was. We don't, we, it's not reviewed in our, in, in, it's not exposed in the scripture, but if he was human, he certainly probably had some emotional turmoil inside. But he answers, he keeps his head in the crisis. Again, I'm sure he felt those negative emotions we all naturally would feel, but from what we see, he didn't let those things control him. He at least knew that God sat on the throne and desired the opportunity to seek God and how to respond to the situation properly. Look at verse 16. Then Daniel went in and desired of the king that he would give him time, that he would show the king the interpretation. He asked, can we just have a little time uh, maybe we can figure this out. He was proactive in trying to solve this, solve the crisis versus going hysterical. Which led to, secondly, the confidence. Now, Daniel knew that God had a solution to the issue. He knew God well enough. He had watched God already work out some things for him. He, he, he was at a level of spiritual maturity where he, he, he knew that God had a solution to the issue. Daniel was familiar enough to not know that God knew the dream of what the interpretation was. So Daniel collects his companions, and they hold a conference with God. Look at verse number 17. Then Daniel went to his house and made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, that they would desire mercies of God of heaven concerning the secret, that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. What happened here is that they, that he gets together and says, guys, we've got to ask God to show mercy to us 
for our lives, and that by giving us the, the solution to this dream that the king's requesting. And they have this conference with God. They have a prayer meeting in so many ways. And they begin to seek God's mercy on them and, and wisdom for the situation that's swirling around them. And it was intense. I mean, uh, the guard was at the door to take their lives. So a very intense situation that was taking place here. But they, got, they were able to buy enough time where they could begin to ask God what to do. Their response to this crisis is a great example for us to follow. The Bible says in James 1.5, If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not. You know, again, God will give us wisdom how to handle the situations that we're dealing with if we seek him and ask him for it. It says in that verse, he upbraideth not. In other words, God's not going to get mad at you. God's not going to tell you, uh, go away. He's very liberal when it comes to giving out wisdom. Very liberal in that regard. Too often, though, we don't do this, number one, or we do it half-heartedly, or we are not patient and waiting for the answer to come. We, we, we just are so emotionally upheaval that we just can't wait for the, the direction to get there. You know, this when they went to when they went to prayer, we're not told how long it was, but it appears that it, there was a little bit of time, maybe a few hours. I don't know. Because in verse 19, after they had gone to prayer, then the secret was revealed in the Daniel. In the notice the ninth vision. It was at night. It might have been in the middle of the night that God gave him the understanding that they needed. But too often, uh, we maybe get a little too hasty, we don't wait, or we just frankly don't begin to seek God for an answer on what to do. Proverbs 3, verses 5 through 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, but lean not unto thine own understanding. You know, the Bible tells us we are not to lean upon the things that we always understand. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. It's not an if statement, it's a shall statement. It will happen. But sometimes we start trying to engineer our own ideas and how to handle the difficulties we encounter in life. In the midst of that, we can become pretty un or we can make some pretty unwise choices. Choices that maybe make the problem worse. Choices that cost us more than we have to than it has to be. And oftentimes, because of our own rationale, we'll justify compromising even the most basic of God's commands. That happens, and that can happen in a crisis. Why? Because we're just trying to escape the emotional difficulty we're feeling, and so we'll be we'll like, oh, we'll just justify, oh, I, I'll just not do something God told me to do. Sometimes it's just even the very basics of God's commands. Just basic stuff. Stuff that we would call kindergarten Christianity. It's very easy to do that in a crisis. Because we're not sure what to do. When we do that, our problems just only grow worse or elongate them. Things just dwell longer. The better option is to seek God and ask Him, Lord, what do I do? What do I do? Daniel and his companions knew that God had an answer if they would be willing to seek him, and they did. And God gave them the information they needed in verse 19. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in the ninth vision. Now, you may not get ninth vision, but God will reveal the secret, if you will. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. God knew what to do in this circumstance. So it goes on, and it's just, it's just praising God for his wisdom and power. It says, and he changes the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise, and knowledge unto them that know understanding. He revealeth the deep and secret things. You know that God knows every intricate part of the circumstance that you and I are dealing with? He knows the behind-the-scenes stuff. He knows the, the things that will work and won't work. That's why sometimes... You've got to get the wisdom of God on certain things because you, you can't compare it to somebody else's circumstances. You know, the Bible says it's not wise to compare, oftentimes, with other people because 
you can be in a similar circumstance with somebody and uh, that somebody else has that they handle it one way and you have to handle it totally differently because there's certain things that, that are behind the scenes that are affected that, you, that only God knows how to best deal with. And God may lead somebody to do something different than another person, but that's just the wisdom of God knowing the specific circumstances that exist. See, he, he revealed the deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness. He knows what's behind the scenes. He knows what's, the, what's going on. He knows all the intricate things. He knows all that. Hence, he can tell us what the right thing is to do. I think there's an instance in, in the Old Testament where David... The Philistines had invaded the land, and David asked God, God, should I go off and smite them? And God said, go ahead, go and conquer. No problem. And he did. Well, they came back again another time, and David said, God, should I go after them again? And God said, no. You, you, you go over here, and you wait until the, there's a moving of the mulberry trees up above, and that's when you know that the Spirit of God has gone forth, and you'll be able to conquer. But he gives them a different plan on how to deal with it. But they were the same people. They just defeated them not that long ago. But he had to do it a different way. And sometimes we need the wisdom of God to know how to handle each specific circumstance because every circumstance might be a little bit different. And there's details that are involved that only God knows about and that, and that he alone can only give us direction on. Because he knoweth what is in the darkness. He knows what's in there. He knows, he knows all the details. And in all of our troubled areas of life, God has some wisdom for us so we know how to successfully navigate the circumstances we find ourselves in. Because he's an all-knowing God who knows every detail, every angle behind the scenes. And sometimes, too, that wisdom will even go against what we want to do. <laughs> sometimes it's like, no, that's not, what I, that's not what I think should be done. That's not what I want to do. But that's when we have to decide, okay, Who's superior here? God or us? God or us? Now sometimes too we begin to see God and God doesn't answer right away. God had an answer right away here because the things were pending. But sometimes God doesn't always answer right away. Sometimes he makes us wait. Sometimes he makes us wait for an answer. Why? Because some, a lot of times too certain things have to be done at the right time. Or God has to do some preparation work in the meantime, we give you the right direction. God will always give you something to do. But sometimes, the, the things that we think need, are needed to, to rectify the circumstance, God might just wait on it just a little bit. But he has promised to guide our steps by giving us the wisdom we need at the right time. Psalm 48, verse 14 says, For this God is our God forever and ever. He will be our guide even unto death. He will be our guide even unto death. God will guide us. But sometimes he waits to give us the details that we need or, or the next step. Or sometimes God will just give us enough information to take one step. And then you have to keep asking him. And have to keep asking Because timing is everything. Sometimes the timing is necessary just to get us into a better emotional state of affairs. <laughs> you know, sometimes, sometimes it's that. Regardless of when and how, God does promise he will give us wisdom that we need if we seek it. If we seek it. We will have many times in our lives when we will not know what to do about certain circumstances. However, I have no idea what to do. But God always knows. So we can look to him for the guidance we need. Now today, is there anything right now that you're experiencing that you don't know what to do about? I don't know how to handle this person. I don't know how to handle this situation. I don't know where, you know, what to do about it. Have you spent some time literally seeking God with a submissive, sweet spirit? Say, Lord, what should I do? And waiting until he gives it to you. And not doing anything until he gives it to you. Because he will give that wisdom. He will give that. God did it right here. At the right time. As we see thirdly, the culmination the culmination. 
Upon receiving the information he needed from God, Daniel was escorted into the throne room of Nebuchadnezzar to give Nebuchadnezzar the interpretation of the dream and consequently stopping the mass execution of the wise men of Babylon. Look at verse 24. It says, Therefore Daniel went in unto Arach, whom the king had ordained to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said unto him, Destroy not the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king, and I will show unto the king the interpretation. And then Arach brought in Daniel before the king in haste. <laughs> I don't think Arach wanted to do this. And said thus unto him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah that will make known unto the king the interpretation. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, Art thou able to make known unto me the dream which I have seen and the interpretation of it? And Daniel says, And Daniel does something interesting, worth pointing out here. I believe God revealed this dream to Daniel because Daniel would be bold enough to declare who had held the information about the dream to begin with. Not Daniel himself, but God alone. Look at verse 27. Then Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king hath commanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers show unto the king. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. There's a God in heaven. What is he saying here? He's just letting that look at as we know that all those powerful men can do it, but there's a God in heaven that can do it. That knows these things that are troubling your soul. And I don't know if this is the first time, but at least the first recorded time that Nebuchadnezzar begins to learn about the God of heaven that existed. And I believe this was part of the whole situation. This situation was part of God's plan of revealing himself to Nebuchadnezzar because I believe Nebuchadnezzar eventually gets saved if you read through the book of Daniel there. But he began to get exposed to the God of heaven. Yes. Quite possibly may have started this circumstance. That there's a God in heaven that can give you the understanding that you are seeking. Daniel made it very clear to Nebuchadnezzar that was the truth. Verse 30. But as for me, the secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living. So this isn't found in me. It was, it was found as a result of God revealing it to them. When God gives us wisdom to navigate something, we should acknowledge before others whose wisdom we're using. It's not ours, it's God's. He just imparted it to us. And God knew that <clears throat> Daniel would do that. The crisis was averted. Now verses 31 through 45, we won't read, but it's the interpretation of the dream that basically it expounds the kingdoms that would come upon the world through the end times. There's a great study, it's a great prophetic lesson we won't read that here today. But after this whole thing takes place, verse 46, Daniel 2. Then the king Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and worshipped Daniel and commanded that they should offer an oblation and sweet orders of man. Nebuchadnezzar didn't quite get it yet, but he will. Then, king answered, then the king answered unto Daniel and said, Of a truth, it is that your God is a God of gods. He has to recognize there's something special about Daniel's God. And a Lord of Kings and a revealer of secrets, seeing thou couldst reveal the secret. Then the king made Daniel a great man, and gave him many great gifts, and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon, and chief of the governors over all the wise men of Babylon. Then Daniel requested of the king and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Hananiah, Mishael, or Azariah, their, their Hebrew names, over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel sat in the gate of the king. What happened? God engineered the crisis for good. He engineered something for good. Daniel got into a very high position of leadership within Babylon and would maintain that. Of course, his companions, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would as well as a result of this. Remember, it was just a few hours ago they were supposed to be dead. Now they're elevated in a position of great authority. Why? Because in the crisis, they got the wisdom of God to deal with it. They, they got the wisdom of God to deal with the circumstance so that they could come out at the right place. Again, before God does anything good and great through our lives, He will put us through crises. He will allow some things to, 
to conjure up so that he may be glorified and that we may be promoted oftentimes. But the only way to get through the crisis, the only way to get through the situation is by getting the wisdom of God and seeking him to know what to do with all of that. Again, are you dealing with something right now you need wisdom for? And I say, God knows what to do. He knows what to do. He's put that there to show us that we can be this And may we, this morning, get his wisdom to navigate all of life's situations, especially the sticky ones. Let's go ahead and stand up. Let's have a brief word of education for this morning.